the main attraction here is the, the main chamber, which you see out that window as you walked in. Uh, it is the largest climatic chamber in the world. We can go down to minus 65 Fahrenheit. We can go up to 165 Fahrenheit, uh, including all ranges of humidity. Uh, that chamber is serviced by a refrigeration system that's rated at 990 tons of refrigeration, which uh, is equal to about 1,500 home air conditioners. So it's quite a lot of refrigeration power we have here. Uh, in addition to that, we also have uh, three very large boilers, which provide steam that then can heat up the chamber when necessary. The chamber was specifically designed to be able to fit a C5, since that is the largest item in the U.S. military's inventory. It's primarily here to do the test and evaluation for uh, all the uh, climatic <coughs> regions for our military users, the military programs. However, we do have spare capacity sometimes, and at those times we allow uh, commercial ventures to come in and do testing as well in support of uh, our overall national economic objectives. And uh, you'll see a, a prime example of that today. We were confident enough this was the, the flight down here was either the ninth or tenth flight for ZA-3. And we were confident enough in the aircraft to bring the NEA people on board and ferry them five hours from Seattle. So what we're actually specifically here uh, at the McKinley Climatic Lab to do is extreme weather conditions. And we arrived on uh, Sunday, as Matt said. We had uh, 98 people on board, and that was a mixture of flight crew as well as test engineers like myself, um, a pretty substantial maintenance technician, we refer to as shop uh, support, that are actually working on the airplane while we're here, and then uh, a huge body of support staff just to make the whole operation work. Um, we landed on Sunday, we got the airplane prepared, um, defueled, and then we actually went into the chamber on Monday the 19th, um, got ourselves prepared, shut the doors and started cooling down, and started actual testing on uh, Tuesday. Right now we're in the cold weather round. We, we came in initially, pulled the chamber down to uh, negative 15 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and did some of the initial testing and now we're down to minus 45 today, which is the coldest we plan to go. Um, for every test procedure, uh, it, it basically runs the same way. We stabilize the airplane um, both physically and temperature-wise. So uh, we'll be going into a cold soak period today. Once the chamber's stable, we'll start our clock and allow the whole airplane to um, reach equilibrium with the rest of the chamber, the temperatures to match up. Once that's done, uh, our technicians will go through the aircraft maintenance manual procedures that we give to our customers to prepare the aircraft to operate uh, from cold temperatures. So we're validating exactly the same thing an airline would do if they had to park the airplane in these sorts of conditions. This is the worst case at the hot and cold ends of you've parked overnight, you couldn't keep the airplane warm, it's now, the whole structure is now 45 below zero and you have to bring it back up to a flight condition. So we finish up with the cold weather testing. Uh, we'll go the whole other direction and then we'll call it hot. And that's, a, as with cold, it's a two stage. So we'll go up to 90 degrees first, um, perform some of our systems tests and then ramp up to 115 uh, and, and finish off. And that should be um, the end of our work here once we get through the 115 degree testing. Um, the procedure is exactly the same as the cold side um, in terms of the sequence. The prep steps are obviously different. There's, uh, you don't have to worry about, for example, the water freezing when you're at 115, but there's other parts of the aircraft that need to be adequately prepared. The major focus is absolutely the environmental control system, heating and cooling of the aircraft. Um, there's a lot of supporting components to make that um, function, uh, for example, the APU and the batteries to get it running. Um, so. The, but the major focus is get the airplane, it's sort of a bootstrapping problem. If it's really cold and we can get the APU running and the computers up and the environmental control system comes up, from there the environmental control system can warm the rest of the airplane up or cool it down if we're coming from the hot side. So once we can get the plane running and the air conditioning system powers up and functions, that will take care of bringing the rest of the system up to an operating. So you know, in, the, in the sort of 70 to 75 Fahrenheit target cabin temperature, once we get there, all the rest of the systems warm up, and we know how the plane behaves in those conditions. So the real interesting part for us is how does the environmental control system bring the airplane from the cold of the hot state to the normal running state. This aircraft is the first commercial aircraft with a liquid power cooling system. Um, so that's of significant interest. And then uh, the, the ECS, or environmental control system, is all new. Um, so of course we're very interested in its performance, its ability to heat and cool the cabin and cargo hold. 
Each aircraft in our test fleet is instrumented somewhat differently because of the different missions we expect to be on. ZA-3 is very heavily instrumented for systems performance. Um, so that primarily comes in the form of um, thermocouples for temperature all over the aircraft um, and uh, pressure transducers and other components to monitor system health. Uh, so part of the preparation that you're referring to is um, fitting quite a bit of extra instrumentation to support this type of testing, um, primarily thermocouples. Uh, temperature measurements, um, and then uh, on the on the data system side, like all of our other test aircraft, there's an onboard data recording system. We have specific for this test uh, what's best described as a remote data system. So it's connected to the aircraft system, but it means that our instrumentation guys are sitting in a 70 degree hut in the chamber watching the instrumentation, not at minus 45 in their mittens. Uh, so there's a couple of sort of auxiliary pieces of equipment to make this type of testing possible. Part of the the testing we do every time we bring the airplane up from the cold soak state to the operating state is to run through all the systems, including the flight controls, and, and verify that they're operating as we expect them to. Um, much like other Boeing aircraft of recent vintage, um, the aircraft will give you a message if there's a fault in a system. So as part of that startup procedure, we go through all the systems and look at all the messages we've received and determine is that, you know, is it a nuisance, is it a true fault? Is, and look at the cause, and that's why we have a huge body of engineering support here on really every system on the aircraft to look at those things.